Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our presentation on the changing workplace landscape. Um, I can see that the uh, participation participant numbers are steadily going up. So um, I'll maybe wait another 10, 20 seconds for those to come through and then we'll kick off. Okay, well, we'd like to uh, start today's presentation by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. Uh, for Darren and I, that is the Jagera, Yuriga and Turbal peoples. Uh, we'd also like to pay our respects to elders um, past, present and emerging. All right, Joe, if I could ask you to move on to the next slide. Okay, so our agenda today is to have a general recap of the changes that have come through the legislation so far, and then to spend the majority of the time focusing on the key changes that uh, we see arising out of the closing the loopholes number one and two um, bills or acts, I should say, and um, their impact on employers. Uh, I would um, say that if anybody has any questions uh, that they have during the presentation, we certainly invite you to put those forward. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of the, uh, the Zoom link, or Zoom page, I should say. Uh, so please put your questions there and we'll uh, attempt to answer as many of those as we can go through. Uh, we will also be putting together a... A question and answer document which will circulate to participants after the, the session. Okay, Joe, if you can move on, please. Okay, so in terms of um, where we are today, obviously there has been significant change to the workplace uh, environment that has been introduced by the current Labor government, the current uh, federal Labor government. Particularly, we've seen changes in regards to uh, the respect of work, respect at work, which came through in 2022. Similarly, the um, uh, Secure Jobs Better Pay amendments that came through also in 2022. We saw significant change in the, particularly in the bargaining arena for those uh, who were coming out of that legislation. Uh, and we also saw changes that were brought in from the paid domestic violence leave um, in 2022. In 2023 and 2024, we saw the introduction of the uh, closing the loopholes legislation number one and two. Now, you might recall that, that legislation was originally put forward as one large piece of change, but was subsequently broken into two parts to help facilitate its passage through the, the Senate. So if we look firstly um, at the slide here in regards to the closing the loopholes number one, we're, these are the things that we're currently dealing with over the last six or so months. So we've seen the introduction of the same job, same pay for labour hire workers. We've seen through the commission there's been some contest around what that means in respect of uh, service providers as opposed to labour hire um, providers. We've seen the introduction in the legislation to workplace delegates' rights uh, as a protected um, attribute, particularly in regards to adverse action. Um, and as we'll talk about later on, we'll see that there are further amendments which will flow through in terms of the modern awards and enterprise agreements. We've seen the introduction of... Uh, compulsory conciliation conferences for PABO conferences, oh, sorry, PABO ballots. And uh, my personal experience with that, I think many others is that those have had very mixed results. I've also seen uh, protection for employees subject to uh, family and domestic violence and changes around rights of entry for health and safety representatives and the small business redundancy exemption provisions. Joe, if I can ask you to move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so that brings us up to where we are 
currently, what are we facing in the next 12, 24 months? So obviously the immediate um, change is going to be in regards to uh, provisions that take effect from the 1st of July, 2024. And those are the introduction of criminal offences for industrial manslaughter and particularly the changes to modern awards, enterprise agreements and workplace determinations to include delegates' rights. Later in the year, from 1 November, we'll see further changes uh, to possible in regards to regulated labour hire orders, and those largely are an extension of the um, same job, same pay provisions that we've seen introduced already. And then effective uh, from 1 January 2025, we'll see the criminalisation of intentional wage underpayments introduced as well. Thanks, Joe. In terms of the second part of the closing the loopholes legislation, uh, these are the provisions which we expect will, will come through from 26 August 2024. Uh, and these are really the key features that we're going to talk about today. Um, so we've got the right to disconnect. We've got casual employment changes, changes to labour hire, changes to the way that independent contractors are managed, some changes in regards to uh, union rights of entry and um, similar, um, some further changes to enterprise bargaining, particularly around intractable bargaining uh, declarations and the criminalisation of intentional wage underpayments. So Joe, can I ask you to move on? And then as we go into next year, from the 26th of February, we'll have changes to the model, model enterprise agreement, flexibility, consultation, dispute terms, and then later still the uh, the introduction of the right to disconnect for small businesses. So Darren, did you want to talk about those changes? Yeah, thanks, Ben. I think um, you know what we've seen so far is that you know with the closing loopholes, Bill Number One and Two, um, we've seen some of the most significant changes uh, to industrial relations law since uh, you know Fair Work was introduced to the Fair Work Act in two thousand nine. Um, and with that, there's been some concerns and some criticism around the complexity and the potential long-term consequences of that. Um, I think to date, what we've seen is, you know, the implementation of the majority of things in closing loopholes one, uh, uh, as well as uh, some of the other pieces of legislation. Um, and I guess that, you know, what we've really seen is a greater emphasis on an importance placed on the employers, um, and that is to comply with those sweeping changes that are coming through. Um, so I think the challenge is trying to keep up to date with that and keep yourself informed of what those changes are. And hopefully today's session will give you some insight as to uh, how you can go about implementing some of those uh, those changes that you may need to do. Thanks, Darren. Joe, if you can move on to the next slide. Okay, so we thought that it might be helpful if we could get uh, a quick poll of uh, what are the key issues that uh, you as employers uh, are concerned about in the next 12 months or so. So I think Joe is just firing up the, um, the, the, the poll. Thanks, Ben. It should be live for everyone now. Okay, so I might just ask everyone to finish up the poll. So Joe, are you able to put up the results? Okay, great. So um, yes, certainly right to disconnect. Um, that is something which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, clearly 
that is of uh, significant concern. It's a new right. It's very unclear what it'll mean. Um, and so we're getting a lot of inquiries about that at the moment. So that doesn't surprise me at all. Similarly, I guess in regards to casual employment, the changes that will bring. All right, so I might move on to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. Okay, so this brings us um, appropriately to our first topic, which is the right to disconnect. So um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, this is a new right. Um, it was not something which was particularly pushed by the ALP as part of um, its legislation, but was uh, a concession made to the Greens uh, on the crossbench to get the, the legislation through. Um, I would say that since that time, certainly the union movement have jumped on this pretty heavily, uh, and we'll um, talk about that in regards to uh, where we see the changes, and particularly as they relate to what's being proposed for the modern awards. So put simply, the right to disconnect is the right of an employee to refuse to monitor, read or respond to contact or attempted contact from an employer or from a third party. Ordinarily, that would be a client or um, a supplier of the employer. Um, it doesn't stop the employer from making that contact. It just prevents the employee from having to respond to that contact unless they're their refusal to do so is um, unreasonable. There will be the capacity for parties, both the employer or the employee, to make an application uh, for a dispute before the Fair Work Commission in regards to what is reasonable and what isn't reasonable. It will, uh, I guess, also importantly be part of the general protections regime as well. So it gives an employee an additional limb on which to claim that their employment has been dismissed because of an unlawful reason, i.e. they um, hadn't responded to correspondence or a, a phone call that the employer had made. I think importantly for this new right, it's important to understand that it's going to affect employees in different ways. And we see that it largely fall into probably two broad groupings. So the first is those employees that uh, there wouldn't ordinarily be any um, expectation that, in, that they might be contacted out of hours. And, and I think that would those employees would largely be uh, traditional award-based roles, so retail, hospitality, et cetera. Um, manufacturing in certain circumstances as well. But there will be a, a relatively large second group uh, where there may be, for example, uh, a requirement to engage with, um, with clients or other employees of the employer in different time zones. Um, so within Australia, obviously, we have a number of different time zones and that's exacerbated by... Um, daylight saving uh, when that's um, in operation, uh, but also it could be in circumstances where somebody has to engage with um, employer uh, management or employer clients um, that are outside of Australia, be that New Zealand, Asia, the States, uh, Europe. So I think importantly here, there's a, a going to need to be an understanding of what are the particular requirements that an employer has and then approaching that um, based on, on those particular two groupings. So Darren, did you want to talk a bit further about that? Okay, thanks, Ben. Um, I, I think, you know, and as sort of it's, it's come about in the poll, you know, this is probably one of the areas that is, uh, is most significant. But what we're seeing is... Um, you know, it is a big change in the way we work uh, across a number of sectors. And, 
you know, it has the potential to impact current working arrangements, um, the approaches to flexibility, which, you know, we've seen implemented significantly over the last few years and how we communicate with our employees. Um, I think initially this, this right was intended to stop employers from contacting their employees after hours um, and there was potential penalties if they did so. Um, what we're seeing now is it's been determined that the right to disconnect um, is sitting with the employee. Uh, so therefore, the employee can choose whether or not to monitor uh, any after hours contact and whether they choose to um, reciprocate. Um, so as been mentioned, I think yeah, there's a test here that you know an employee may refuse to monitor, read and respond to uh, any sort of contact outside of their working hours. And that can be from their employer or a third party. Um, but unless the refusal is deemed to be unreasonable, so it comes down to this uh, reasonable, unreasonable test. So um, there is some definitions around what unreasonable uh, could be considered. Um, such things uh, that we factored in would be the reason for the contact, um, how the contact is made and the level of uh, disruption it causes to the employee. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, whether the employee is compensated to remain available uh, for working additional hours outside of work, so that might already be in contracts already. Um, the nature of the employee's role and the employee's level of responsibility. So as we've seen with uh, you know, manager type positions, there is an expectation already that they do and remain contactable outside of their ordinary working hours. Um, and the employee's personal circumstances also need to be taken into consideration. So adding all those things up, um, there's an opportunity there to, to determine whether or not, um, you know, the request would be reasonable, unreasonable. Um, I, I think that, you know, this right to disconnect uh, is certainly a workplace right now. So employers need to be very careful around that. Um, you know, there, there will be, uh, it's a general protection provision from taking adverse action against an employee. Um, if the employee has indeed you know, exercised that right uh, in choosing not to connect uh, in res yeah, if we talk about resolution and how we can resolve, you know, these these types of matters, and if the employee chooses not to not to engage, um, in the first instance, you know, you'd be looking to try and engage with that employee at the earliest possible time to try and resolve the matters in the at the workplace level. Um, if those discussions, you know, don't resolve the situation, uh, either party can then apply to the Fair Work Commission uh, to make orders to resolve the dispute. Uh, again, would be thinking that those uh, tests around the unreasonableness would be taken into consideration in those circumstances. Um, as uh, as it happens, any breach of the Fair Work order uh, can result in the civil penalty, so there's no change there. Um, so I think, as I've alluded to, you know, employees should carefully consider the kinds of out-of-hours contact they have with those employees uh, and whether or not it's essential or not. Um, and employers should determine whether employees within the organisation uh, are, are remunerated in a way that takes that into consideration. Um, <clears throat> so I think where an employee's re uh, remuneration has already been set uh, in a way that takes into account the expectations, I still think that there's a requirement there that employers should be reviewing those contracts uh, to look at uh, the wording in the contracts to ensure that it actually captures that information uh, specifically in detail. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, in regards to senior senior type positions, still that requirement to review the contracts of employment with those those individuals to make sure that it's uh, it's capturing the the ability to uh, engage out of hours contact. Um, I think moving forward, we we're really not really having seen what's happened in this space uh, yet, but we are likely to see some challenges. In, uh, occurring in the not too distant future, so it's a very much we'll uh, we'll see what comes out of the Fair Work Commission. There will be some guides and some insights that the Fair Work Commission will continue to provide. Uh, so we'll be keeping a close eye on that, and uh, we'll continue to provide some information in regards to that. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, as um, Minister Burke said, when this legislation passed, this was really about promoting discussions between employers and employees about what are the expectations we get about out of hours conduct. So, um, and, and we think fundamentally that's right. We think the the steps as Darren um, has uh, set out are really to, to start having those conversations now before the, um, the right is introduced, um, where there is a clear expectation that uh, 
that an employee is contactable out of hours, that that's been um, clarified and understood by them, and if necessary, um, adjusting to uh, or adjusting the contract accordingly. Um, certainly, for new contracts, capturing that. The other piece of this, I think, also is some potential training for perhaps middle managers, lower or middle managers, so that they clearly understand the expectations when they're communicating with their own staff and don't accidentally uh, uh, accidentally cause an issue that the employer doesn't really want to have. All right, Joe, was there any questions about um, that? Thanks, Ben. Um, I do have one question. Uh, it just says here from one of the participants, if a contract includes a standard clause about following our policies and procedures and we update the policies and ensure that PDs include out-of-hours our, requirements, is that sufficient? Reissuing contracts can be tedious and disruptive, so I'd say they're looking at not doing that. Yeah, look, thanks, um, Jay. Look, I think that's a really good question, and I think that's also a really good approach. If the, if the contract is read in conjunction with policies and procedures that dictate expectations, then those policies and procedures can certainly be updated without necessarily having to um, enter into a new contract. I think the important part there is that when the employer is proposing to update uh, the policy or indeed uh, introduce a new policy that there's that that's promulgated to employees that they are given the opportunity to provide some feedback that again prompts that discussion around what is um, appropriate uh, for their particular role uh, and um, then put it into effect. Thanks, Ben. I've just got another one as well. Um, what about contacting employees to work in situations where you are short-staffed? Darren, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, and I, I, I look at this and, and uh, in context where you've got employees who potentially might be called in sick and you need to replace staff or for whatever reason you might be short-staffed and, and need to connect with your employees. Um, you know, I... I you still need to run the business. So, uh, you know, in the absence of having employees on site, I think that there's going to be a need and a requirement for an organisation or a business to be able to connect uh, with an employee. So it doesn't stop this, this legislation and this change doesn't stop employers from making that contact. Um, it's the, the right of the employee uh, to choose not to connect. So it sits with the employee, not so much with the employer. So yes, absolutely, um, you know, you can certainly make contact uh, with employees, especially in circumstances where uh, you're short staffed, um, but uh, be treading cautiously around, you know, how many times you try to make contact with that employee uh, or employees to try and get them to come to work uh, for whatever reason. So for example, um, if uh, you knew you are gonna be short staffed on a, uh, on a Monday and it was a Friday, and you continually try to connect with an employee over the period of the weekend, um, the employee may choose not to connect uh, until such time as it might be Monday morning before shift uh, that they that they connect in. So I think uh, you know there's not a I guess a right or wrong answer, but it does stop uh, the employee from having the ability to uh, to make contact with the employees for the purposes of trying to fill shifts uh, to run the business. Yeah, I guess interestingly on that point. Um, the ACTU submissions in regards to the uh, standard clause to go into modern awards pushes for the employer to take all reasonable steps to ensure that there's sufficient labour to avoid those sort of circumstances. Um, now, I think the commission is not going to be persuaded by that, but certainly we're, we're seeing unions trying to push the employer to engage to a certain extent surplus labour to minimise against those sort of um, absenteeism issues. Okay. Thanks. Ben, there was just one more that's connected to what Darren has said, so we might just do that before moving on if that's all right. Of course. Um, it said here that, Darren, you mentioned we expect to see some disputes coming forward. What types of roles or industries do you believe are more likely to breach the new legislation? Um, I would say industries that are uh, particularly 
uh, heavily infiltrated with union uh, association membership. I think that's where we'll see the challenges coming forward. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I can't see any particular industries that I would highlight and say that you know there's going to be uh, this particular sector or industry. Um, you know, I, I'm yet to see anything myself personally come through, but I'm sure that we will get some some challenges and some um, some disputes being raised. Uh, but you know, I I, I wouldn't uh, be putting a suggestion out there as to say what industry we're yet to see that. But I think it'll be across the board. Um, and once we start to see some some cases coming through around this, we'll start to see a few more um, with people following suit. Yeah, I guess just on that, I think there's a reasonably high likelihood that there will be disputation in areas where an employer operates on a 24-7 continuous basis. So the operations of the business don't stop. They need, particularly if there's been something that's happened during one shift and then that hasn't been resolved by the end of the shift. And so it may be necessary to call people after hours um, by the oncoming shift. So I think that kind of circumstances where there's that continuing operational need, um, that will, I think there's a reasonable chance that that will prompt the, that sort of disputation because it brings into stark conflict the operational requirements of the business as compared to the employee's right to disconnect. It's a bit different from, say, a standard nine to five work operation where kind of people down tools, so to speak, and then start again the next day. Thanks, Ben. All right, Joe. Um, just conscious of time, so we might move on to the casuals then. So the next topic that we're going to talk about is changes to casual employment. Um, these changes have come about specifically to address uh, the High Court decision in Rosado back in 2021. Um, in that decision, the uh, High Court said that the parties were to look at the rights and obligations that each of the party held um, to each other uh, at the time of engagement, particularly as set out in a written employment contract. And having considered those requirements, if the employee was deemed to be casual, then they were casual forever and a day, unless there was an agreement to vary that. Um, the changes that are coming into play take us back to the position which the full bench of the federal court um, found in the Rosado case, which is effectively that irrespective of what the parties have agreed to, it was necessary to look at what the actual relationship was um, in practical terms. And the wording that was used in that decision is now picked up in the legislation is the consideration needs to be given to the real substance, practical reality and true nature of the relationship. Um, so certainly since 2021, we've had some comfort that if somebody was recognised um, as a casual employee, that that um, was the case and, and we could move forward on that basis. What this um, change will do is effectively take us back to pre-Rosado, which means that there will need to be an ongoing consideration of what is the nature of the relationship um, between the, the parties. So the definition of casual uh, employment, which will be introduced, really has two limbs. The first limb is that there's an absence of a first firm advance commitment to continuing uh, an indefinite employment and that the employees are entitled to a casual loading or specific rate of pay. So what that means is that uh, employees and employers can offer and refuse work as suits their particular needs, um, that it's not intended that it would be an indefinite ongoing employment. And that sits somewhat at odds uh, with the um, definition of a long-term casual um, under the Fair Work Act, uh, particularly for the concept of uh, protection against unfair dismissal for those employees. 
Also, there will be a change to the casual conversion provisions, um, which will essentially provide the capacity for an employee, casual employee, uh, after six or 12 months, depending on the size of the business, to nominate that they wish to convert to permanent employment. The employer is required to consider that uh, request and can only refuse it on reasonable business grounds. And then the last component of that, uh, or the, the casual changes, is the introduction of a casual employ employment information statement um, that employers will already, sorry, employers will already be familiar with um, some information statements in regards to the national employment standards and so forth. So it um, there is an additional requirement uh, to provide information about. Um, the casual employment changes and the rights um, and responsibilities of, of casuals. Picking up on the casual conversion component, um, we think this is on balance positive for employers. And the reason for that is that uh, the current circumstances oblige an employer to monitor um, an employee's um, service and at the requisite periods of time, uh, identify to the employee that they're able to make a request um, and then, then go on to um, consider that request. Um, that administrative burden is taken away from employers and it will sit solely with the employees. So um, if an employee chooses not to be casual, then they um, they just don't nominate uh, that they wish to convert to to permanency. So that that will decrease the, the the admin burden that employers do need to deal with. So Darren, do you want to talk about these changes? Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, <clears throat> I think if you've certainly touched on the um, majority of things that I was uh, going to discuss anyway, but uh, I think what we can certainly talk about is um, you know what happens in circumstances where the employer uh, refuses uh, the conversion or the change. Um, so I think there's going to be some um, some changes introduced in regards to how the employer should respond, um, and the employer can you know ref can still refuse uh, the change uh, if any of um, you know certain circumstances apply. Um, so the employee still meets the definition of a casual. Um, there are you know fair and reasonable operational grounds for not accepting uh, the notification, and they might include substantial changes um, in the way the employee works. Um, there would be significant impacts on the operation of the employer's business, for example. Uh, other things might include uh, substantial changes to the employee's employment conditions. Um, so accepting the change means that the employer isn't complying uh, with the recruitment or selection process required by law. So I think that um, there are opportunities for the employer to refuse as long as there's um, uh, meeting some of those expectations and those criteria. Um, if there's still a dispute about whether or not it is uh, is it agreed to, um, disputes should be tried to be resolved at the uh, the workplace level. Um, those disputes can then be referred and heard by the commission, um, and the commission would generally first try and resolve it through an informal uh, process, uh, either by mediation or conciliation. Um, <clears throat> so I guess if we look at the impact on an employer. Um, what we'll see is that employers will no longer have that administrative burden, as you mentioned, Ben, um, and I, I think it will be an easier process for employers um, going through the whole casual conversion process. So the onus will sit with the employee. Um, as you've indicated, uh, an employee who chooses not to convert uh, or, does, or chooses not to apply uh, will just continue on uh, as a casual employee uh, and receiving the benefits uh, of a casual Um, the other thing I think Ben you've touched on is the casual employment information statement. Um, it's a new introduction uh, similar to the NES, the provision of the uh, information statement upon commencement. Uh, casuals will need to be provided now uh, with the casual employment information statement moving forward. Um, so there'll be changes around, or sorry, there'll be um, some differences as to when uh, that might apply. For small business, it might be... Uh, uh, around 12 months after employment, but for new employees, uh, for non-small businesses, uh, it's before or as soon as possible after the start of their employment. Um, and then all new casual employees employed by non-small business employers um, 
uh, after six months of employment and then 12 months after employment again and every subsequent 12 months. So there is that um, onus to on the employer this in this aspect to provide the casual information statement. Um, but as I said, I think uh, on whole, I think the, uh, the onus and the obligations placed on the employer is less of a burden than what it was previously. Okay, thanks, Darren. Um, Joe, have we got any questions on casuals? Yes, we do have do have a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start at the top. Um, so this one here, someone just asked um, that the ACTU is pushing for an increase to casual loading to 35%. Is there any likelihood that this would be supportive or have we heard anything about this? Uh, I think it's unlikely that um, there'll be any real increase to casual, an increase to the casual loading. Um, the loading has been calculated at 25% for probably about a decade now. Um, obviously, as we went through the award modernisation process, there was a uh, the particular, I think from my recollection was that New South Wales at that stage did have a higher casual loading and there was a transitioning back to that 25%. Um, I think that on balance, the commission is mu much more likely to look to address cost of living pressures through a change to general wage rates and obviously that will then flow on a, a, a greater benefit to, to casuals because of the casual loading. Thank you. Um, there's just another one. At what point does the employer need to invite a casual to convert to permanent? Darren, you want to talk about that? Sorry, Joe, can you just repeat that question, please? At what point does the employer need to invite the casual to convert? So I think what, what what we've just gone through is that the the employer doesn't have to offer the employee that opportunity uh, to convert. So the, it actually sits with the employee. Um, so I'm not too sure if that question is based on you know after the event or rolling after the event. Um, you know after six months, uh, does the employer have an obligation to? No, they don't. Um, so I'm just not too sure on the question um, if it's in regards to you know, at the engagement of a casual employee or if it's post the engagement and post an employee uh, accessing that right to convert. I think potentially, Darren, what you, you were talking about the ongoing obligation to provide information statements and, and that might prompt an employee to, to um, put a request forward. But again, yeah, no, no ongoing obligation for the employer to specifically request uh, or notify an employee that they can make a request. Correct, yeah. Thank you. There's also one here. So what happens if a casual employee refuses to convert to full-time employment when the opportunity is offered? Uh, they will stay as a casual employee. So um, nothing changes from that perspective. Just having a little look, there's a couple, so I'm just mindful of time. Someone says here, if we have an EA that has a casual conversion clause, will the changes override it or does our EA clause still apply? Uh, that is a good question. Um, typically, the an enterprise agreement, so that the, the changes that are coming through will uh, sit within the national employment um, standards. Generally speaking, the... Uh, national employment standards would operate to the exclusion of an enterprise agreement provision, but only to the extent that they are more beneficial than the enterprise agreement provision. So um, it's quite possible that uh, the um, commission might determine that an enterprise agreement provision is more beneficial to employee and um, doesn't supplant the national employment standards, but adds as an adjunct to it. So that that would necessarily need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks, Ben. I might um, hold the rest of these, just being mindful of all the topics that we have still to come. Um, all right. Thanks, Joe. So we might move on to the next topic then.
Okay, so the next topic we're looking at is in independent contractors uh, and the position that's been taken here in, in terms of the changes to the legislation is a similar approach to that that's been taken in regards to casual employees. Um, and that is uh, that there are two decisions in 2022 of the High Court, um, one being personal contracting, the other one being JAMSEC. Uh, and the decisions there held that uh, an employer and employee, sorry, an employer and its independent contractor could enter into a written contract of employment and provided that the, that contract dealt with the rights and obligations of each as an uh, as a principal and a contractor, I should say, not an employer, then um, there would be a determination made on whether the um, that that person or that party was an independent contractor or not. And if that was held to be the case, then they were or remained um, an independent contractor, notwithstanding um, how the relationship may change over time. So the legislation has been very clear. In fact, there's a note in the legislation to say that um, the amendments are a direct response to those two decisions. And um, they deal with it by, or the legislation deals with it by introducing um, for the first time really a firm definition of what an employee is. And it says that it's um, employees to be given its ordinary meaning, considering the con sorry considered in the context of the real substance, practical reality, and true nature of the relationship between the parties. So what this means is that it takes us back to that those pre high court decisions, uh, and if uh, businesses are engaging with independent contractors, then it's not a one time definition determination as to what the nature of the relationship is. It will be an ongoing um, assessment as to that relationship. There are other changes, uh, particularly in regards to um, what are regarded to as uh, regulated um, workers. So these are employee-like uh, arrangements, particularly in the gig and transport industries. Um, we don't propose to go into those uh, in significant detail today, just because they are fairly specific to those industries. Um, but it is worth noting that those changes are coming through. In regards to independent contractors more generally, there will also be the um, introduction of a unfair contracts jurisdiction. Um, it kind of reminds me of the old adage, the, the more that... Uh, matters change in um, industrial relations, the more they stay the same. So it's very much a return back to independent uh, contractor, unfair, uh, sorry, unfair contract jurisdictions that we've seen uh, in state jurisdictions, particularly Queensland and, and New South Wales previously. So Darren, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, I can do. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think when we look at, uh, you know, the, I guess, the difference in relationship between an employee and independent contractor, I think it's pretty straightforward that, you know, certain things will apply. Uh, for example, uh, whether or not they're covered by the National Employment Standards uh, and or the minimum entitlements under an award. Um, it's whether or not they can access the unfair dismissal jurisdiction, uh, whether superannuation is paid um, on their behalf or whether, you know, pay tax is also um, <clears throat> deducted from their earnings. So they're, they're, I guess, some common things that you would look at to determine whether or not uh, the individual is an employer or a contractor. Um, but the changes to the Act uh, regarding independent contractors uh, are intended to provide a framework for dealing with unfair contract terms, or UCTs is what they're uh, being referred to uh, in service contracts. Um, and that's that they uh, the balance the needs of the organisation and the independent contractors. They address the needs for a level playing field between independent contractors and organisations or principals. Uh, they establish less formal procedures for dealing with UCTs um, that address the needs of organisations and independent contractors. Uh, and they provide remedies uh, if a term of service contract is found to be unfair. So um, 
they're the majority of the changes I think that uh, we need to be aware of uh, as we move forward with um, with uh, contractors and uh, and the like. All right, great. Um, Joe, any questions around contractors? Not on this one at the moment. So if we're happy, I can move on. Yep, let's move on to the workplace delegates. Okay, so as I think we spoke about earlier, there are already some changes that have been implemented to the legislation in regards to providing rights for workplace delegates and in particular protection um, under the general protections uh, regime um, so that uh, if a delegate is dismissed, there would be a presumption um, rebuttable, of course, um, that uh, there participation in that um, function um, was a contributing factor to their dismissal. Where the current uncertainty sits is in regards to the uh, changes which are to be implemented into the various modern awards in terms of workplace delegates' rights. Um, that will come into effect uh, from the 1st of July the main features there are, or the, certainly from employers' perspective, uh, that it has, or they have been pushing for the Commission to have a fairly um, open ended uh, provision, which largely mirrors the changes to the, to the legislation. Um, the ACTU have sought to have quite a perspective. Descriptive uh, approach uh, in terms of rights uh, and particularly um, rights as to uh, training participation. Um, and one of the areas where we're seeing some contest at the moment, um, at least in the most of the commissions trying to determine what it introduces a model clause, is firstly in regards to the number of delegates that uh, an uh, a union might be able to appoint. Um, at this stage, that's uncapped. So obviously there's a concern that a significant number of employees will say that they've been elected or, or appointed as a delegate. Uh, and also in terms of the training um, that uh, delegates might be able to participate in, um, the Commission has proposed a, a ratio of um, one delegate for each 50 employees. Um, the unions are certainly very opposed to that and they think it should be a much lower ratio. Uh, and then as we've got on the slide, um, really a new area for workplace delegates and that is in, in the space of um, regulated workers. So those are those employee-like arrangements. So for, in practical terms, still independent contractors, but um, have uh, there will be the capacity for delegates to be engaged um, within that um, that sphere. So, Darren, do you want to talk about the steps that we can be taking now? I, I think that uh, we've we've covered the majority of things there, Ben. Um, just with workplace delegates, um, again, again, I think it's a case of we'll just be uh, watching what um, how this is introduced uh, and how. Uh, workplace delegates uh, start to enforce their, I guess their um, their rights within the workplace. Um, as with the existing provi uh, the provisions, you know, there's a burden for establishing that you know the conduct of an employer is not unreasonable. Um, <clears throat> and but despite these changes, I think employers will still be able to undertake reasonable management actions. So I think that's important to understand that whilst these um, <clears throat> union uh, delegates or workplace delegates uh, have continuing rights that uh, the employers still have the ability to take reasonable management action where it's required uh, if it's carried out in a lawful way and if those employees are uh, performing or acting in a way that's considered that action needs to be taken. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether if during the course of a performance management of an employee, they suddenly get uh, nominated as a, a delegate um, just to afford them some general protection beyond what um, they may have as an, uh, a regular employee. So it'll be interesting to see how this provision is actually used by unions to try and protect their members. <clears throat> 
Um, Joe, do we have any questions on union delegates? No, we don't at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, we might very quickly then just touch on the next topic, which is um, that from uh, the beginning of next year, there will be uh, criminal sanctions, which can be applied for intentional wage um, underpayments. Uh, this sits as part of um, a, a range of changes which have been introduced by the um, the Labor government over the last couple of years in terms of uh, ensuring um, employees are paid um, in accordance with the relevant um, industrial instruments and, and protected that way. Um, Darren, did you want to talk about this one quickly? Yeah, okay. I mean, just quickly and mindful of time, I think that, um, you know, there's going to be an increase in civil penalties uh, applying uh, to contraventions um, uh, that may extend up to five times um, what is uh, the actual penalty imposed, increase the uh, civil penalty for failure to comply with the compliance notice. Uh, that would be increased by 10 times. Um, <clears throat> Enabling the maximum penalty uh, for a contravention to be determined by reference to three times the value of the underpayment, um, or if the underpayment can't be um, you know, determined, uh, that amendment to the scheme would see for serious contraventions uh, would apply to uh, reckless contraventions of the relevant provisions. So I, th I, I think that what we'll see is um, significant penalties handed down over a period of time. I think that there will be hopefully um, some sort of leniency applied, but employers need to be very mindful of the fact uh, that these civil penalties are being introduced and there's been an increase in those civil penalties. All right, great. All right, Joe, we might move on to the general questions. Was there any um, that you wanted to talk, uh, bring up? Yeah, of course. Um, unsurprisingly, a lot of these are back, taking us back to casual employment questions. <laughs> So I just have a question here that sort of asks, it, it. what's the obligation where it's an on-hire or a labour-hire casual? Is there any obligation on the employer in relation to casual conversion? In the context of a host employer, that is um, a business that is engaging labour from um, a labour-hire provider, no, there's no obligation um, to talk about or or deal with casual conversion because there simply isn't an employment relationship between that entity and and the the employee concerned. Um, ultimately, there could be the potential for a labour hire casual to seek permanency with the labour hire provider. Um, I think in reality, though, that tends not to happen uh, because uh, employees who are uh, often going through a labour hire provider as their employer um, are doing kind of work where they're particularly looking for the casual loading. And then that may, depending on the requirements of a particular enterprise agreement, so if if you're a food manufacturing business and you have a obligation under your um, enterprise agreement to offer permanency to labour hire providers after a certain period of time, that's one thing, but that that um, that doesn't change because of the change to the legislation. Thanks, Ben. I just have two questions that are very similar here. It's about asking where there's a lot of fluctuation, but they're still providing casuals with fairly regular work. Um, we have casual employees in both these circumstances who don't want to give up the loading, the 25%. Um, how can they manage this? You know, Is there a risk to not offering? Sort of what should they be doing here? Darren, do you want to answer that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, the risk is is much less than what it was previously, and it's the employee's choice uh, as to whether or not they want to convert. Uh, so, if an employee is choosing that they would like to, you know, maintain their twenty five percent loading and the benefits of being a casual employee, uh, 
um, the risk on the employer that you know the that casual employee might be working regular and systematic hours um, and for one of a better term working you know similar to what a, a permanent type employee might be um, as long as they've gone through and they've got records of that individual who has either not chosen to um, convert uh, or if they've gone through the process of putting um, notification to the employer stating that they don't want to convert, I think there is a very minimal risk, um, if not any risk, associated with the employer um, when engaging a casual and continuing to provide sort of regular hours for those casuals. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is that um, there is nothing in the legislation to stop the employer um, asking an employee if they want to convert from casual to permanency um, and then having that documented if there's a uh, rejection of that um, that uh, conversion. Um, and obviously that documentation can be used uh, at a later time if the employee says that, well, in truth, I've always been a, a permanent employee. So there are certainly steps that the, uh, an employer can take to minimise that risk and provide the evidence to protect itself should a claim be made at a later time. Thanks, Ben. Uh, there's a question here about the delegates' rights. So someone here has asked, how does the general protections right work for workplace delegates where there's no specific sort of clause or rights in an enterprise agreement? Is this in the context of uh, the general protections regime? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um the general protections regime will simply say, or does simply say, that uh, a employer cannot take adverse action against a person because they happen to be a workplace delegate. Um, the definition of adverse action includes a number of um, elements, but it could include dismissal, demotion, refusal, refusal to promote, um, so forth. So. Um, what it will mean is that uh, in, under Section 361, um, if a complaint of general, a breach of uh, the protections is made, then there is a presumption that the asserted reason um, is the reason that the employer took that action, the adverse action, um, unless the employer can show that there was some other reason for that action being taken. So um, it's most likely to come up as an alternative claim to an unfair dismissal claim. Uh, if a uh, person who's a union delegate is dismissed and um, then says that the reason for their dismissal was because of the fact that they were a delegate. Okay. Um, Joe, I think it's we're just on 12 o'clock now. I appreciate that we're coming to the end of their time. So we might leave any remaining questions for uh, a follow-up document we're able to put together. Uh, I would like to say thank you to everyone for their participation um, today and their questions. Um, certainly there are some very interesting questions that people are um, concerned about these issues. So if uh, you have any um, particular questions that we've not been able to address or you'd um, like to uh, put those questions to us directly, please do feel free to reach out to Darren or myself or any of the other MAPIAN um, consultants. I think the major takeaway from today should be um, that we know that these changes are coming, um, that we've got still some time and opportunity to consider proactively how we'll deal with those and put mitigation measures in place um, so that we're not caught in a reactive situation um, at some point in the future. Again, thank you. Um, Darren, did you want to say anything in wrap up? No, I think that's uh, covered off pretty well, Ben. I think, uh, you know, it's very much a watch watch and see, uh, watch this space to see what happens uh, as we move forward. But um, certainly I think the employ from an employer point of view, um, just monitoring these uh, these changes and uh, how they may be implemented in your business, um, looking at contracts of employment, looking at your policies and procedures to see if they need to be updated uh, is probably a first step that I'd be taking. But uh, other than that, um, yeah, thank you very much for your time, everybody. And uh, I think we can draw the uh, draw the session to a close. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody.